Welcome everyone to our webinar this evening called Dial in Your Deck Details, presented by Brian Pontalillo. Uh, I'm Rob Watzak. I'll be your host for this evening. Um, you may know Brian as the former editorial director here at Fine Home Building. Brian spent the better part of the last 20 years as a journalist, writer, and editor covering residential design and construction at Fine Home Building and Green Building Advisor. Brian has a degree in professional writing, worked for a short time at a local newspaper, and has also worked in landscape construction, paint, has worked as a painter, and worked as a carpenter for becoming, before coming here to the Taunton Press. On his current, current hiatus from full-time employment, Brian is designing and building what he hopes will be a pretty good house up here in Northwest Connecticut. Uh, again, I'm gonna give you guys a few moments to file in. We've got a bunch of people already here. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'll also want to, before we get started, I wanna thank Feeney for being tonight's sponsor. Feeney produces a wide range of outdoor architectural project products, including their popular cable railing systems, complete aluminum railing systems and awnings. Uh, you can find out more about their products at feeneyinc.com. Okay, as, and as we get started here, I'll direct you to the bottom of your screen. There's a chat box there and uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us where you're, where you're tuning in from tonight. And you can use the chat box throughout the evening for comments or discussions between other attendees, but be sure to set your settings to all attendees and panelists so we can see uh, your responses so everyone can see them. And uh, we'll, we have a Q&A tab as well. Go ahead and drop questions in there throughout the presentation, but we're going to wait till the end to do a Q&A session with Brian. So um, uh, I think that should cover it. And uh, I hope you enjoy our presentation. And uh, here's Brian. All right. Thanks, Rob. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And yeah, thank you to our to our sponsor. It's always it's always nice to have um, help. Um, it's always nice to have help getting these things going. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, I, I was, I, I admittedly didn't know exactly what to call this uh, webinar. Um, it's not really easy to do really deep how to in a webinar format. And obviously we, we're not gonna do really deep how to if we're not on site building a deck where, where we can really see that happening. So I, I call it dial in your deck details and we're gonna cover a lot. We're gonna cover um, two parts of designing decks and then we're gonna cover building decks. Um, and I think by the end of this, if, if you are new to uh, deck building or uh, maybe even inexperienced but have built some decks, I, I hopefully you'll, you'll take away um, a little bit. But I also, you know, I want to mention that um, as Rob mentioned, uh, or he shared my background a little bit. Um, and I have worked on a, a bunch of deck projects, some of my own, I've helped out on some. In fact, one of the earliest building projects I ever did as a teenager was uh, to help out on a deck. Um, I've rehabbed uh, a, a deck that was really in, in rough shape. I've refinished some decks, but I am by no means a master deck builder. And my hunch, um, in fact, I'm sure that there are some people in the audience tonight because I know the fine home building audience that know a lot more about deck building than me. So I really want to encourage you all to to use the chat box if you have questions please put them in the chat and if you can answer those questions please respond in the chat um, and let's see if we can make the make that chat box as useful as possible and help out as many people uh, with their questions as possible i really appreciate that um, so thank you everyone so as i said we're gonna um have two parts tonight to this uh, webinar. Part one is design. So designing a deck and um, really this slide kind of says it all in a way. Um, one of the things that I noticed the most about um, decks that well, poorly designed decks is that the people just didn't think of the deck as they would a room. And uh, they just sort of um, thought of it as a, a a shape or a space or uh, an appendix on their house, but they really didn't think of it as a room. And if you can take, and we're gonna get to some specifics in a moment, but if you can just kind of take the same thinking you would apply to a room or even, even bigger, say even a floor plan um, to your deck, I think it'll be hard to go wrong, um, go wrong with your design. So I came up with, um, with the help of, of a lot of articles on designing decks that I've been involved with over the years and some, um, 
you know, some expert advice, I came up with um, a bunch of design considerations um, for decks. And these, it says in some particular order, because I do think uh, you need to start with getting the size, right? Like the first thing that you um, want to do is make sure that you have enough space in, in general for what you want to do with your deck. Uh, colleague of mine, uh, mentor Chuck Miller, um, called decks that were too small penalty boxes. And I think maybe you've had that experience. You go out on a deck with a, particularly a deck with a railing um, that's just not big enough. And you really feel, it, it can make you really feel claustrophobic. So, you know, getting the design, uh, the size right is, is probably the most important thing to do first. Um, and then think about your deck, as I mentioned before, as, as a floor plan, as you would the a floor plan, a schematic plan for inside of the house. Um, I think those are two important first steps um, the rest of this um, order is less specific, but we don't want to forget about shade, views, um, privacy, lighting. And then I didn't really know how to phrase the last one here. So I just said, take a step down, like get off the deck and see what it looks like. Um, we, have a, we have a great looking deck um, in this on this slide, but we also want to consider what this deck looks like from other views, from the yard, from the street, if you can see it from the street. So we'll look at all of this now. So the first thing I did um, when it came to size for decks is I reached out to a friend and, and an architect, um, Paul DeGroote. And I, for with Paul, I just said, Paul, give me your bare bones minimums for decks, um, the smallest acceptable sizes you can think of. And Paul said, can I respond to you with some drawings? And so the next three slides have the drawings that he um, responded with. And so the first thing is this is this is barely a deck, right? This is really a landing outside of a door, but it's built like a deck. And he said, well, if you need, a, you know, if you're going to have a deck that's this small um, for uh, entry or exit from your house, and if you if you just want to fit a couple of potted plants on it or or something ornamental, then here's here's sort of the minimum sizes. I think three feet is uh, actually a code requirement for a landing outside a door um, and then to give it six feet in width so that you have about 18 square feet uh, bare bones minimum deck. And then he gave me a deck um, that's basically a sitting area, right? So somewhere that you can have a couple of chairs, maybe a small table, maybe a potted plant. Um, and here he said about seven feet by eight feet is um, workable, but tight. Um, what you'll notice on this drawing um, and to get to to start to get to another point is that he already started to think about this like a floor plan. Like not only did he draw on the furniture, make see see where it points, where the view is, how it fits, but he also added um, sort of this traffic pattern out the door and just a real easy way out the door and down off of the deck to grade. Um, so then Paul sent me um, the the sort of the the smallest big deck. So um, a deck sized for dining at a minimum. Um, that means that it fits a table. This is a small table, just you know, four chairs. It fits a grill. Um, and here he was looking at about um, about ten feet by. You know, he says twelve to thirteen feet is tight, and six and fourteen to sixteen feet is is great. And he he made an, a note here that said, with this size deck, you could actually turn that table in both orientations, and it would work. Um, so he's actually thinking, you know, and this is how we should all think when we're designing decks is, you know, not not only like a floor plan but also a little bit of flexibility. What if you don't want to use the deck in this way forever? And again, he gave us that same uh, very simple um, traffic pattern um, out these double doors and, um, and down to grade. Okay, so here's another way to look at that. This was from a um, fine home building article, this drawing um, by Scott Shutner. And I think you can find this in fine home buildings uh, deck project guide. Um, in fact, you'll be able to find a lot of what you see here in Fine Home Buildings Deck Project Guide because um, I stole a lot of my illustrations from FHB. Um, so I definitely, if you want, if you want more of what I'm offering um, after this webinar tonight or in the future, that's where I would start. Um, so, you know, Paul kind of designed a very sort of elaborate deck for this article so that he could show us a bunch of different spaces and how much room he would give that space. You know, and he's got a, a 12 foot area here, 12 foot out from the house area here for like his the main social area on the deck. Um, he's saying the four feet is sort of a minimum for the walkway, or we can say like you know, the traffic area, um, eight foot 
for a designated special use area. That might be where you plant a couple of chairs to capture a view. Um, the six feet minimum for sort of this area connecting spaces of the deck, um, eight foot minimum for a common use area. That again, that might be a small table, a sit seating area. And then he's looking at stairways and he's saying that uh, three feet um, to four feet is really minimum and he likes four feet to six feet. So these are sort of some really, um, you know, again, rules of thumb from both Paul and Scott, rules of thumb for making sure you have enough space um, for your deck. And of course you can always, these are, I think these are minimums, you know, consider these minimums and you can always add a little bit more. Um, and probably best to have a little bit more than maybe you think you need, if possible. So then um, I just wanted to look at this slide. We built this, we designed and built this deck at Fine Home Building many years ago. And um, we, when we were kind of in the planning stages, we looked at a few different ideas. And um, what this slide shows you is, uh, illustrates really well is how you can think of a um, deck and, and as a schematic. So you can think of it the same way you would think of, um, of a room inside or a space inside. And even in this, the smallest, uh, most bare bones deck here, you've got your built-in benches and your fire pit um, well, well out of the traffic flow to either of the stairwells. You've got a dedicated space for the grill. Um, we kept that and moved to a, a bit bigger deck that now had a um, place for a dining um, for a dining table. It also shifted the grill into another place, giving more room on the deck. And then we stepped that up, you know, even to a, a more elaborate um, uh, schematic where we added a little bit more seating and we gave the, um, the grill a really prominent area with some shade, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about more about shade in a moment. So this is the kind of planning that I would do if I was designing a deck um, and even a simple deck um, like we saw in Paul's drawings, even a simple deck, just to know um, where um, the where you're going to put things, where you're going to put your furniture, where you're going to put your plants, and how you're going to walk around on this deck and move around on this deck, get from the house to the ground, which is not all decks uh, take you to the ground, right? Not all decks have a staircase going down, but most of them do. And so thinking about that is important and worthwhile. Okay, so the next thing um, on the list is is shade. And there's uh, there's many ways to create shade. You know, I, I was I've never been a fan of um, the aesthetics of awnings, but I've actually been living with one for a little bit now, um, and actually now really appreciate the retractability of an awning. And um, you know, the place where I'm living right now has this really great deck, um, and it has a lot of western exposure. And the deck can be really great all day long. You kind of have this nice dappled sunlight or partial sunlight um, with some natural shade from the house. And then when the sun comes around the building and, and it later in the day and hits the deck, it's, it's sort of overbearing. And the fact that we can put out this awning and create some shade at that time for um, evening meals is really, really nice. So I've, I've gotten over my, um, my feelings about uh, the aesthetics of awnings, but we all have opinions on style. Um, the the more common um, and maybe prettier, in my opinion, option for creating shade is to uh, use a pergola. Um, and we have two examples here. You can use a pergola to sort of create this uh, dappling effect where you have some sunlight, some shade. You can use a pergola and you can plant um, you can plant a, a vine or a climbing plant on the pergola to create shade. Um, as you see in this, um, in the bottom bottom right photo here, you can you can have outdoor curtains, um, which are an interesting idea and really give a deck a kind of room-like feel. And then of course you can just have a table with an umbrella if that's what what works for you. Even that you may think about um, that you may plan for, you may think that I'm going to have an umbrella and it's going to take up a certain amount of space. And do I wanna have a little extra room to get that umbrella away from the traffic area, away from the house where people are gonna be walking so they don't feel like, get claustrophobic, um, feel like they're gonna bump their head on it. Um, but if, you're, if your deck has a lot of sun exposure, definitely worth thinking about shade. 
of course, we're going to get back to the original photo here, um, which I needed to use more than once because it's such a pretty picture, but let's not block the view. Um, and there's not a, a whole lot that we're going to do with the deck in terms of blocking the view, but maybe we want to, um, with the exception of railings, which I'll get to in a second, but you know, not only that, but let's capture it. And I really love this deck for a few reasons that go beyond just the way they captured the view with this seating area that points so nicely at the view, also with the glass railing that doesn't obstruct at all. But I also just love the style of this deck um, on a body of water like this, which has this sort of you know, curvaceous coastline, and they gave that same sort of treatment to the deck. I think it's really, really pretty and, and really well done. So make sure that you're capturing the view um, if you have one. It, even in this, this might even, you know, you might even take a step back to like if you're if you're planning a um, new home, if you're designing a new home, and you're going to want to think where are the views and should there be a deck there or a patio or even just great windows, but um, are there views that need to be captured and how am I going to best to best capture them? Um, and then of course you wanna, you wanna also maybe uh, protect your privacy. And I another, I think really beautiful project here. Um, I, I'm not sure what is, what is through these trees, but I kind of feel like the fact that there's a fence back there and the fact that when you look through these trees, you see a lot of sunlight, my guess is that there is, um, that there's something on the public side back there, um, whether it's another property with a house on it, or I don't know, who knows what it could be, right? A golf course could be a street. Um, uh, it, this could be in more of a downtown area than it looks like. Um, but I really love the way they kept the trees. They kept the trees close. Um, they kept the trees literally um, coming up through the deck. And this, this deck just has such a nice private um, appeal to it. And I think for a lot of, in a lot of situations, that's going to be the case. In fact, um, Rob mentioned right now that I'm, I'm building a house this spring and we have, um, with the, with the uh, landing at the front door, we have three decks to build. And um, one of them is meant to be private deck. It's off of um, the bedroom and it, the, the lot is very open and very clear and we do live in a neighborhood. So I'm starting to think about ways and it's in, in my case, it's probably going to be not structural. It's probably going to be plantings, but already starting to think about ways to make that, that back deck off the bedroom be much more private than the, you know, the large social deck that's going to be off of the side of the house. Okay, so um, let's talk about lighting for the evening time. Um, so to start with, you're probably going to, going to have some code required lighting on a deck. Um, and so, for example, um, I believe that the building, most building codes call for a couple of um, lights or a light outside of an entry door. So you'll have that light. Um, I think that stairs are required to have, to have lighting within some vicinity. I'm not actually sure of what the codes are for that. Um, I think that, you know, the best uh, decks and landscapes that I have um, had the uh, pleasure to to check out um, have taken sort of the same three-part lighting strategy that you would take to take in say for a kitchen, right? Um, where you think about first ambient light, like just in general, is there enough, um, is there enough light to give the, the room the glow, the space the glow that it needs? Um, and I think certainly there's a lot of ways to do that on a deck. Um, then task lighting, you know, in a kitchen that would be like lighting for your countertops. Um, here might be lighting on that, uh, for that table surface in the middle of the seating. Um, I would also consider this lighting on the stairs to be task lighting because it's about safety and, and uh, alerting people that there are stairs there and helping them get down them safely. And then accent lighting. And I, I really like the way that they lit um, the garden here. So the, like the way they have some lights shining up on the plants in the garden. I think this is really, this is really pretty. Um, and it's a good example of a well-lit deck. Um, and there's lots of uh, products available I believe Fine Home Building has an article in the deck uh, guide about deck lighting. There's tons of great products available to incorporate right into your deck, like these, um, like these lights on the stair treads um, and the lights in the post. There's railing lights, there's rope lights, there's all sorts of stuff that you can play around with and have fun with. Um, it's important to think about it early because these uh, they'll need to be wired um, and 
often that wiring in a deck situation, often you'll need to find some creative ways to um, hide that, that wiring. Okay, so um, I, I mentioned what taking or considering what the deck looks like um, when you're not on the deck. So what the deck looks like from the landscape or from the street. And I think, you know, everyone has seen, maybe some of us have, I know I, I had one for a long time, um, decks that are elevated off the ground. And, and I'm not going to show any grade level decks um, as an example um, for for this part of designing your deck, um, I think grade level decks are a bit easier um, to make look good from off the deck. It's, it's these decks that are elevated that can be more challenging. And one of the things that's sort of become a, a ubiquitous or more common is just to ground the deck like you see here with some, here, here we have these horizontal slats. It could be some type of, of lattice, but it kind of brings that, it grounds that deck. It gives it a more substantial feel. Um, it can also be used to hide what's underneath the deck if, if that is, you know, just number one, not pretty, or if maybe you wanna, you know, create a, a storage area, um, that kind of thing. This is real easy to do. And um, you just, you may need to think a little bit ahead about how, you, you know, when you're planning your framing for your deck about how exactly you're going to do something like this. But again, it's simple and very effective. Um, this, this example is a little bit more elaborate, but really beautiful. Um, I, I love the way they gave this um, deck this kind of furniture like feel. Um, and, you know, not only did they do that with the posts and the beams and the railings and the trim around the, the, the fascia trim there, um, gave it this really beautiful look, um, showcasing craftsmanship, which I think is probably near and dear to uh, many of our hearts. Um, but they also made the space under the deck um, feel a little bit room like. Unfortunately, the air conditioning compressors are there, but they put, um, you know, they put a ceiling there, they put a ceiling fan, and I imagine that at times there's a table or something underneath that um, ceiling fan. I love the spiral staircase, that's, that is a nice touch, um, maybe not as practical or safe as a more conventional staircase, but often figuring out how to make a stairwell look good from a higher deck is also, a, you know, can be challenging, and now that I'm saying this, I'm wishing I had an I, I had included an example of that um, sort of straight staircases that, that extend from tall decks to the ground are challenging to make look nice. I think incorporating a landing um, and maybe turning this turning the stairs is a nice way to um, to make those stairs you know look a little a little bit nicer. Okay, so that was that was the first part. Those were my um, thoughts on getting your getting your deck design right. Um, and now we're gonna move into part two, which is uh, construction. I'd like to note as I start um, to speak a little bit about construction details for decks that as challenging as the building codes can be, and, and building codes in this case, um, anything that I reference will be from the most recent international residential code, the 2021 um, code. And your codes, um, wherever you build, I mean, as, as everyone knows, you know, there's, there's some states that adopt the most recent um, ICC uh, code book as soon as it is published, and there are states that uh, lag far behind in adopting. Um, they use the the international residential code, but are way behind in adopting it. And there's places that you, that where you may be somewhere where you don't have building codes. Um, so local codes are going to vary. What I like about um, the deck building section, which is the which is chapter five in the um, in the IRC, is that of all the codes that you it, it may encounter, it's, it may be the most systematic section that I've come across where you, it can really, um, it really walks you through everything you need to know to build a deck with a few exceptions where it, it kind of um, sends you off to some other chapters. But um, uh, so in this case, I would say, let, you know, let the codes be your guide. And if you have any questions about deck building that, um, you know, that, that you start, that maybe you go there and just see if you can get your Get your question answered there. So with that, let's dive into um, let's dive into building a deck. So one thing that most decks are going to have, not all, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but most decks are going to have um, 
footings. Um, so this is sort of footings are the foundation, or let's say half of the foundation, because your house's foundation is the other half of the foundation for an attached deck. Um, footing size, that's what you've got to get um, right. Uh, footing size, footing depth, and we're going to talk a little bit about footing installation. Um, that's that's sort of those are sort of the three things that you're going to need to get right here. And footing size is determined by the live load of the deck. So uh, 40 pounds per square foot is the live load for a um, for a floor in the building codes. And where that may be, where that may need to go up is if the ground snow load in your area is higher than that. So it's determined by the live load of 40 pounds per square foot or the ground snow load if that's greater. And so you can you can look up what the ground snow load is in your area you, and you can use the charts um, throughout for footings and throughout um, throughout the IRC knowing um, knowing the ground snow load in your area or using that live load. Um, the second thing is going to be the tributary area and I'll explain what that is in just a second, but that's basically how much of the deck an individual footing is supporting. Um, the load bearing value of the soil and um, I'll talk a bit about that in just a moment too. Um, you know, you have to get the, the depth right. So there's a minimum uh, 12 inch depth for deck footings, um, but that is, that's the minimum. And that's where there, that's going to be where there is no frost depth. If you have, you live in an area where the ground freezes, your footings will need to extend below the frost line. So for example, in the area that I'm, working in um, right now, you know, we have about a 48 inch frost depth. Uh, we have to go down about four feet um, to get our footings or foundations below frost line. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about alternatives. So what we see here is a very common, um, or maybe with the spread base, not so common, but close to common concrete pier footing for a deck, but there are some alternatives you can use. And what I wanted to, um, I want to go back to the, load bearing value of the soil with this sort of last point here where I've got uh, three asterisks. Uh, if you don't know, ask your building official. So, you know, you may, there, there are ways to find out the load bearing value of your soil um, and that may require a soil test. Um, if you're not sure, it may require an engineer if you're not sure. But what I have found in a number of cases with things like this is that easiest thing to do is often to um, go to the building department in your municipality and ask the building official um, because they may just say here's what you need um, they see you know they see so much building in their jurisdiction that um, often the case is that you can just ask and they'll give you the answer to something like that so um, if you don't know ask and if you're if you're not a professional or an or are a professional but are working in an area where you don't know the building official, a new area for you. Um, it's just a nice way to, to meet and get to know uh, the building official. And I think they really, um, I think they like it when, you know, when we ask their advice and their opinions. Um, it's just not a bad way to get started working with them. So let's uh, look at the tributary area here. So again, I mentioned that the tributary area is how much of the deck an individual footing is going to support. Um, so it's half of the joist span. So it's half of the distance from the house um, to the end of the joists. The, the other half of that is gonna be supported by the ledger, which we'll get to. Um, and it's half of the distance between um, between the the footing and the next footing. And then you have to add on the cantilever if you have your floor joists um, or your beam have a cantilever. So that's, that's the tributary area. So basically you just need to know the size of your deck and then you can figure this out. And I mentioned that there are alternatives. I think the most common thing is that people, um, at least in areas with where a frost depth um, footing is required. It's most common that people pour um, concrete piers, but there are other options. Um, you know, helical piers, I'd like to use helical piers on the, on the decks that I'm going to be building um, later this year. You can hire 
um, an installer to come to your house. They will actually help engineer um, the size of the helical pier that you need. There's no digging involved. And for a deck, you know, if they come in the morning, first thing in the morning, um, you're probably framing by lunchtime if you need a, a handful of piers, uh, helical piers for a deck. Um, there's also a couple of uh, modular options up in the upper right corner is a product that we showed in uh, Fine Home Building not long ago that actually gives you um, these stackable modules so that you can you know, use them for any frost depth. And then there's, if you are building a, um, in an area where you only need that sort of 12 inch, 12 inch depth, um, you know, you can just get, you can walk into a big box store and you can buy these uh, little footings that you see in the bottom right here. And you can um, either set a post, uh, set an anchor into them, um, set posts into them and, and get building really quickly. So there are options besides the, the poured concrete um, footings, um, but because they are the most common, I just wanna take a, a moment to talk about getting them right. So, there's, there's a lot of common mistakes. Um, and first of all, I'd like to mention that one of the ways to avoid a lot of these mistakes is to just use a builder's tube. Um, so to get the, get it, you know, go to the hardware store, get the builder's tubes that you need. Um, you can usually buy them. Um, most areas in, in hardware stores and in the big box stores will have uh, builder's tubes for the frost depth in that area. So, you know, around here, again, as an example, I can walk into the Home Depot and I can buy um, four foot building tubes. And that will solve a, a number of, of problems, um, particularly the, you know, the, the problem that you see just to the right of the, um, of the image in the center with the builder's tube, which is to sort of, to pour a, you know, a uh, ununiform uh, footing that will be susceptible to frost heaves. So as you can see with the shape of that footing and it's got sort of these uneven um, edges, it's got this sort of, you know, cone shape at the top and that is easy for a frost heave to grab and push up. Um, so that you will avoid easily by using a builder's tube. Um, the mistake all the way over to the left a builder's tube may help you avoid, but really that is about um, getting a nice flat surface at the bottom of your hole. So excavating well, so that you don't have this sort of point that can easily um, settle down. You want, as, you want as much bearing as possible. And in fact, we're gonna, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about bearing. Um, you don't want to have a, uh, you want the top of the footing to be level. If your grade is sloped, that doesn't mean you slope the top of the footing. Um, and finally, you want to pour, uh, if you look at the mistake all the way over on the right, you want to make sure that you pour your um, concrete well. And I think what we're seeing there, you know, is maybe the result of a cold joint. So that's where you pour concrete, it sets up and then you pour more concrete on top of it. And you see that crack that's, you know, all the way through. So you want to make sure that when you start to pour your concrete, you're ready to go. Um, you uh, mix the concrete thoroughly, um, you know, it, you, you want to get the consistency right so that it flows well into, isn't too loose, but flows well into your form. And then you want to pour that whole pier as fast as possible um, for the most uh, uniform concrete. And, um, you know, I know that, I know people pour uh, footings for decks with and without rebar. My opinion is to stick a couple pieces of rebar in there. Um, the steel only makes it stronger um, and helps it to last longer. So I typically do, or typically have. And then, you know, when in doubt, use a spread footing. Um, and there's some ways to do this where you don't have to buy a product. You can check out on Fine Home Milling. Um, I think Mike Gurton has submitted this tip in a few different ways. He attaches a garbage, so he excavates the bottom of the hole a little extra big, and then he attaches a garbage bag to with some tape to the bottom of his builder's tube, and he he sets that in the bottom of the hole, um, lifting the the builder's tube up a little bit from the bottom. He lets the concrete fill that garbage bag and creates his own spread footing. Um, but if you have any doubt about the uh, the 
bearing capacity of the soil, or if you're maybe concerned that the soil is in backfill, you can always use a spread base. Um, I mentioned earlier that I had done a pretty serious rehab on a deck. And one of the conditions that we had to rehab was that all of the footings, um, all of the piers, the deck was um, 30 feet long and the grade sloped downhill from one end of the deck to the other. And all of the piers were tilting down the grade. And so when I, when I started to pull, I said, you know, we, we shored up the deck and we took, took the posts out and, and started to pull those piers out. I was expecting to find out that they were maybe not deep enough. And I was surprised to find out that that wasn't the case, that, um, that they were actually, they were actually too frost line. Um, and so when we went to put new footings in, um, I thought, well, okay, maybe this, you know, maybe this yard had a lot of fill and maybe this 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 lot was graded and this this slope was you know was intentionally graded and and so these footings are in fill so we act we went just a little bit deeper with our footings till we felt like we had um undisturbed soil and then we used that we used a spread base um uh, just to get a little bit more bearing the, the wider you make that base of the footing the more bearing capacity the footing will have so um, I didn't get to see, I, I, I don't know how that, uh, that deck is doing now, but I did get to observe it for a number of years and every, the footings were, were doing fine at that point. So, um, you know, that's, it's, 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 I hate to use the word cheap insurance because they're actually quite expensive, but, uh, but might be worth doing if you're unsure at all, if you need it or not. Um, and then I just want to mention that, um, that you can build uh, grade level decks. You can build freestanding decks. Your decks don't need to be attached necessarily to your building. Um, these are, this is all in um, the building codes. Um, and you might not need, if you're building a, a freestanding deck that is not um, too tall, you may not need uh, frost depth footings. So uh, check out code section um, 507. Um, three and look, check out the exceptions. If if your if your project um, if if your project falls into that that sort of category, okay, let's move on to posts. This <laughs> this um, image, which is the 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 one of the first images I found that showed posts. And this image was very controversial when we published it. This is John Spear, who is a um, you know really skilled framer who wrote for Fine Home Building. Wrote probably many of our best framing articles um, over the past 20 years. Um, he had this idea for including his deck posts and his um, deck guard posts um, in one piece of material and just notched them out to accept his beams. Um, people, a lot of people took issue with this. Um, so I just chose it as a, as a fun photo to have in the presentation um, where you, you, you feel about it, how you feel about it. Um, so post size also determined by the live load and ground snow load. As we talk about other elements of the deck, you're gonna see that that's true of all of them. Also um, determined by the tributary area. And now that we're talking about wood, um, anything wood, the wood, the particular wood species is gonna matter. And in the case of posts, um, the height of the post matters. Um, so the taller the deck, the, um, the bigger post you're going to need. Um, this was interesting. Until I looked at this section of the codes, um, I didn't realize that there were all these options for lateral support for um, your deck posts. I actually was, and this is just because of my experience, um, but my experience is not just my deck building experience, but also you know what I've seen working in fine home building over the years. I've never seen any of these options used except for um, appear with a post base. And so your, your, your connection where you connect your footing and your post, you need to have some sort of lateral support there. And the most common, of course, is a manufactured post base. So you pour your pier, you stick an anchor bolt um, in the center of your pier or or find the, the right location for it. If maybe your pier is not perfect, you can you can put that a little bit of off, off center um, to get your post in the right spot. Um, you stick that anchor bolt in, then you attach a manufactured post base to that, um, to that anchor bolt with a washer and a nut, and you set your post in there and use the proper fasteners. But there's all these other options um, that, that are in the, in the code that include burying the footings 
um, and the posts in the soil, burying uh, posts into the concrete and, and any com many combinations of that to get that lateral support that you, that you need. Um, Maybe some of you can, if any of you use any of these options, throw it in the chat. Um, I think that would be interesting uh, for others to hear about. Um, from my perspective, just keeping that, keeping the concrete above grade and the post above grade um, is going to keep the post uh, drier and um, keep it away from the funguses that cause rot. So it seems kind of like a no-brainer, but uh, maybe there's something I haven't thought of. So I'd love to hear from you if you have um, if you have thoughts on any of these other options. All right, so the next thing you'll need to do is um, size your um, and plan your your deck beams. Um, this we've had this question a lot over the over the years at at fine home building about grade level decks. And do grade level decks need a post? And that's why I chose this illustration um, for this first slide on beams, because the answer is no, grade level decks don't need a post. You can set beams right on top of the footing. And um, one nice solution for doing that, you, you need to get, you need to dial in the height of your footings, um, maybe a little bit more accurately than you would um, if you had a post that you could, um, you know, customize the size of. But um, one, one nice way to do that is to put, uh, to pour your footing, put your anchor bolt in, use the manufactured post base, and then just add a little bit of material. So if you need, um, you know, if you need a doubled up beam for your deck, you just add enough material to fill out the um, manufactured post base, use the fasteners, and you're, you're off and running. Um, so beams, um, you have to size by uh, live load or ground snow load, again, wood species, and then your joist span. So in the tables in the, in the IRC, when you're sizing your beams, you'll see that it asks for your joist span. Um, and this, of course, is related to um, that tributary area. So the longer your joist span is, of course, the more, um, the more your beams need to support, more support you, you'll need to offer. Um, Beams can have two options. Here's some illustrations from the, from the IRC. They can be dropped or they can be flush. So that means that your beam can be underneath your joist and your joist can sit on top of your beam or your joist can be, at, or your beam can be set at the same height as your joist and the joist can run straight into the beams. Um, if in that case, you would be using joist hangers and, um, Keep in mind that the and, and there's 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 a few reasons to choose one or these or the other, and some of the reasons might include um, how you're going to mount stairs to the deck. Um, they might include how you want to trim the deck um, and, and finishes that you want to um, finish work that you want to do to the deck, and it might include whether you want to have a cantilever with your joist. Obviously, if you use a flush beam and your joists come and land on hangers on the inside of your beam, then you're, you're taking away that possibility for cantilever. For cantilever, your um, joist would have to sit on top of the beam, and um, beams too can be, um, can be cantilevered. With your beams, you need to think about um, how you're going to connect your beams to your posts and whether they're going to be slice, splices or not and how you're going to do those splices. So um, in these drawings, you'll see that if you have a, a you know, if you have small enough deck um, that you can get away with a single ply beam, then you can get away with a four by four post. Um, and likewise, um, you can, if you're not going to have any splices, you can get away with a four by four post. Um, if you're going to have a doubled up beam, you need to have um, a minimum bearing and you need to have a minimum um, amount of material left on the post when you've notched out for your, for your beam. So you're probably going to need a six by six post. And if you're going to, likewise, if you're going to splice beams together, um, on that post, you'll need enough room. You're gonna have bolts in both beams that are coming together. So um, you're gonna to have to have enough material for that. Again, probably need a six by six post. Here's sort of another look at um, splices. And in this case, you're looking at the difference um, between the, the a beam that sits um, 
on a notch post and a beam that sits on top of a post. And there are, um, if you're going to sit your, your beams on top of your post, there are a lot of manufactured options for hardware to do that, um, that make that nice and easy. Yeah, beams, beams can have cantilevers too. Uh, we'll talk about the cantilevers for joists in a moment. Um, for beams, the, the cantilever um, can be up to um, a quarter of the beam span. And keep in mind that that's, that's just, um, the distinction is that it's the span and not the beam length. So the span would be the distance between posts um, of the beam. It's not the total length of the beam. Um, that's that would be obvious once you started to plan your deck and and laid out your framing. But um, when you're thinking about it, if you're new to this, um, might not be obvious at first. So next thing you need to determine is um, the size of your joists. Same considerations here um, as everything else: the loads, the wood species, the joist span and spacing. Um, so you know you may have may be able to have a longer span with tighter spacing. Um, for unlike that rule of thumb um, with beams and the cantilever, when you look in the codes um, to plan uh, your joist size, the um, cantilevers, potential cantilevers or possible cantilevers are given right in the chart. So you can, you can see it right there. Um, joists need a bearing of an inch and a half. So they need to land on an inch and a half of material, or they need to be installed with joist hangers. And um, they also need some lateral um, support. And joist hangers provide lateral support. So if your beam, if your joists have hangers on both sides, you're good to go. If you have um, hangers against the ledger, and then let's say you have a dropped beam and your joist cantilever, um, or even, even if they ended on the beam for that matter and didn't cantilever, um, if you had a, a dropped beam, you'd have to have blocking for um, lateral support between your joists. Um, this is just, this is a, a piece of advice um, just from, from some experience that I've had. Um, if you're stretching the span of your joist, consider tighter spacing. Um, and, you know, that's, that's different from, I mean, obviously, if you're, you may have to do that, right? If you want to use, let's say you want to use two by eight joists and you, you know, you, but the span is too long for two by eight joists, you may have to go from 16 inch center on spacing to 12 inch on center spacing. What I'm suggesting here is that if you're at the max allowable end of your joist length, consider tighter spacing because you're pushing it and, um, you know, going from uh, 16 inch on center to 12 inch on center is going to add a few, you're going to add a few joists, so you're going to add a little bit of cost, but you're going to take the bounce out of the deck. Um, you're going to make it feel sturdier. And that's a nice thing, especially on taller decks, um, to have that nice, nice sturdy feel. Um, blocking is also a little extra blocking mid span is also a nice way to kind of just kind of tighten things up a little bit. But I would say if you're getting to that long end of your joist spacing, even if you don't have to consider going um, or joist length, even if you don't have to consider going to tighter spacing. Um, the next thing that you'll need to uh, choose and install is decking. Um, when it comes to the uh, building codes for decks that doesn't say too much about um, about decking, except, except to give uh, spans for um, a couple of uh, common uh, board thicknesses, um, which is generally 16 or 24 inch centers. Um, keep in mind that where that falls down is if you have a single uh, span. So you're just spanning from one joist to another with a, um, with a short piece of deck board, which you want to try to avoid to begin with. But um, if you have a design and you're trying to make the most of your materials and you end up doing that, you, it, you would actually reduce the allowable span. So it might, um, you know, you can either do that and, um, and, and tighten up your joist spacing, or you can just, um, you know, have a little bit of waste and not have um, deck boards that, that span a single um, two joists. So for, for little just, you know, I'm not going to really get into, I'm not going to get into um, 
too much of the pros and cons of different types of decking. We know that we've got a variety of wood decking from tropical hardwoods um, like Ipe and many others. Um, we've got natural, naturally durable woods like cedar and redwood. And then we've got you know, pressure treated um, wood that can be used for decking. Lots of manufactured materials now. Um, you've got um, You've got composites, which are, you know, wood composites, um, some combination of uh, wood dust and resins. You've got straight up plastics, and then you've got capstock, which is um, a core material that is different from the surface material, which is usually plastic. Um, and there, there's just there's just so many options. And then same thing with fasteners. Um, this is these drawings are from an article that we did on hidden deck fasteners and fine home building. This is three drawings, three um, pretty common brands um, shown here. There were, there's probably 15 other drawings in that article. That's how many uh, fasteners are available that do some variation of um, hiding the fasteners on grooved deck boards. Um, so lots to choose from. And, you know, there's the, also, this is an aesthetic choice too, because you can, um, you can do, you can screw through your deck boards. You can do surface mount, mounted fasteners. You can leave them exposed. There are systems that come with plugs. Um, if you just want to screw your deck boards down. Um, uh, for me, aesthetically, I don't mind to, I don't mind seeing fasteners on decks at all. Um, the decks that I've worked on with um, exposed fasteners, we've taken the time and care to make sure that they were uh, really, you know, spaced evenly. Every deck board, they were in the same place and that they were aligned perfectly, you know, that we, you know, countersunk them nicely so that they sat, you know, just the tiniest bit, you know, below the surface and they, you know, there was no mushrooming or anything like that. I don't mind that look at all. I think the industry has largely moved towards hidden, some type of hidden fasteners. Um, so, Lots to choose from there. I, I'm just going to mention a few things that you can consider when you're choosing your decking, when you're choosing um, fasteners. So obviously, aesthetics matter. You have to like your deck. You have to love your deck. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna, um, or your clients' decks. You're gonna put a lot of, um, you're gonna put a lot of money. You're gonna put a lot of effort into it. And you're gonna hopefully spend a lot of time on it. So um, aesthetics maybe come first. Um, costs, there's obviously going to be a wide variety in costs, you know, just thinking of the difference. Well, these days, I don't know where costs are on certain things, but, you know, historically, you know, the difference between pressure treated decking and mahogany, for example, is, is going to be an astronomical difference. Um, so costs are important and will need to be considered. Um, installation, so not only um, not only the, the fasteners, but also sort of like the workability, you know, tropical hardwoods are really hard. Um, and so, you know, when you're working with them, you, you're, you know, your tools need to be sharp and, um, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna put a little bit more muscle and effort into, to working with them. Um, of course, durability matters. Um, and so, you want the longest lasting thing possible, which is directly related to maintenance. Um, you know, you might do a manufactured deck board and your maintenance may be washing it. You might do a um, naturally rot resistant deck board and you may say, I'm not doing any maintenance. I'm gonna let this, this weather and gray and, and look really natural. And on certain houses, that's a, a beautiful way to go. Um, and you might have a deck that, um, requires a lot of maintenance. Um, the deck that I was speaking about before with the awning, um, I have now refinished um, twice and it's it's a 30 year old deck, pressure treated boards. Um, when I, the first time I refinished it was, which was maybe 10 years ago now, um, I thought those boards had just a couple of years of life left in them. It hadn't really been maintained well. Um, I did a really thorough job of uh, sanding, um, cleaning, that deck before I even even started to think about finishing it. I think I even used a, I might have even used a brightener on it, even though it was pressure treated and I was going to be using a like a you know semi solid stain. I just wanted to make sure that I that I really just kind of got those boards into the best condition possible. And you know it was it was worth doing it. Ten years later, um, so last year I put a 
I kind of did a you know little tiniest bit of cleanup on it and put a, a fresh coat of deck stain on it and the deck's doing great. And I, now I think it has many, those boards have many years of, of life left in them. But again, it's going to be how much maintenance you want to do. Um, and you can also think about the environmental impact, which may be a really challenging thing to um, to weigh um, from one wood wood product, wood natural wood to another. It may be hard to to determine what is the most um, environmentally benign product, never mind the manufactured stuff. Um, the only recommendation I have there is if that matters to you and if you're doing natural wood, look for FSC certified um, products. Uh, the, the sort of experts that I trust in that area um, will all point, whether it's decking or any other wood material, will all point towards the FSC certification. Okay, so we're, we're on ledgers now. Um, and this is where your deck connects to your house. So ledgers transfer the loads um, from the deck to the, the foundation. Um, there's three loads that, that ledgers have to deal with. And those are the, the vertical loads. So that's your live loads, your snow loads, um, lateral loads, and, and even uplift loads, which, you know, you don't have to think about too much because you're probably using joist hangers and they will take care of that for you. Um, deck ledgers by code are said are meant need to be pressure treated in a minimum of, of size of a two by eight. Um, they can't carry loads from beams. That's one thing to keep in mind if you're thinking about some sort of um, unique design. Um, they can only carry the loads from joists. Um, I worked on a um, deck not long ago. And in fact, this, this gets to the next point. So let me say that before I talk about that, but um, it, ledgers must be attached to a two by band joist or minimum of one inch engineered rim joist. Um, so these two things cannot carry loads from beams and the, the, the rim joists are interesting. I worked on a project where the house did not have any um, any rim joists at all. It just had um, sheathing that came down, covered, um, covered the joists and um, also was going to have exterior rigid foam on the house as part of this remodel. And we needed to figure out a way to make this deck work. Um, and I went to talk to, as I mentioned before, sometimes the best thing to do is just talk to the building official. I went to talk to the building official about it. And we decided to put, um, to cut some holes in the house, uh, set the beams right, uh, deck to set beams on the mud sill, run those beams out to posts and run our joists, um, with hangers from, uh, so parallel to the house between those beams, it was a unique solution. We had to think hard about how we were gonna flash those beams because they're a penetration into the house. It's not ideal, but it was our solution in that case. Um, you can use lag screws or bolts um, or approved structural screws. There's a lot of approved structural screws now, like the ledger locks from uh, Fasten Master and others that you can use to put your ledger on that will have their own um, sort of uh, spacing requirements. Um, the code talks about lag screws and bolts as options and, and says that you can use approved stuff. And with anything that the code, code says approved, um, you can look for, um, use it, when they use that word, it means two things. First, you can look um, up whether something has code approval and you would go to the ICCES um, website and search for the product and see if it has been approved by the um, International Code Council's Evaluation Services. Um, but I've also been told that approved means anything that your local building official will allow. Um, and you know that building official is who matters most when it comes to approval. So check in with them. Um, um, so fastener spacing is gonna depend on loads. Um, joist length and sheathing thickness. And we're gonna talk about um, attaching to brick or stone veneer in a moment. In general, you can't attach ledgers in the more common sense to um, brick or stone veneer. So here's sort of the typical um, way a ledger is attached um, using either a lag screw or a bolt. Um, you know, through that two by ledger, through the sheathing, um, through the band joist. So um, in, in these cases, you will um, drill your clearance hole for a bolt. So a clearance hole is a hole that is big enough, just big enough to allow your bolt to slip all the way through because it's going to be bolted in that, um, 
the bolting action um, is what is going to secure the ledger to the house. Um, a pilot hole for a screw, that's a hole with a diameter a bit smaller than the screw so that it makes, um, it allows you to smoothly put that uh, lag through all of this material, but it is not big enough that your, the threads won't grip. So it's just smaller than the diameter of the bolt so that your threads um, still grip. And in, in both cases, obviously the bolt, but with the lag too, you're gonna want um, that lag to penetrate all the way through um, that rim board a little bit. Um, by code, um, ledger um, spacing, fastener spacing looks about like this. Um, so there are requirements for how far from the ends of the ledger your first fastener is. There are requirements for um, the distance from the top or bottom of the ledger to your fasteners. Um, the fasteners will be in rows, so one towards the top of the ledger, the next one towards the bottom of the ledger. And then that spacing uh, that is dependent upon um, all of the loads is the spacing between um, between those fasteners. And there's a table in the in the IRC that you can look at to determine what that spacing must be. There's tables for almost all of this stuff. Um, again, really helpful to look at the at the building codes. So, when it comes to flashing, um, this is one of the places where the, the codes send you somewhere else. Um, they send you to chapter seven, which deals with flashing for um, everything on the house. And what it says basically is that flashing is required, that it is required. Um, so your ledger must be flashed, um, that it must be an approved corrosion resistant material. There's, there are both metal and, um, and, um, you know, plastic flexible options, acrylic options for approved materials must be installed shingle style. And I, I, I love the last point that the, that the building codes make is that it must keep water out of the building. So you got to do it right. Um, this drawing shows sort of um, what I like, what I think is, is just sort of an excellent um, best practice for deck ledger flashing, which is first to run some flashing um, on the house, on the sheathing, and maybe even down onto the um, foundation that's just going to be behind the ledger. So that would be a peel and stick flashing. Then you can install your ledger, ledger and you can kind of put another piece of that peel and stick that comes over the top of that first piece of flashing, laps over and onto the face of the ledger. Then you can use a metal flashing, tape that to the building and let your house wrap come on top of that. So that's shingle style, right? So if you look at the siding in this drawing, that's shingle style. It's where the, the, the piece above the piece below is in front of the piece below. And if you just think about keeping water out, um, it, it, when you start to think about keeping water out, think about a drop of water running down a building. Shingle style flashing always makes sense. Um, it probably seems like a no brainer to you. Um, I have asked some of our fine home building contributors, experts, people like Mike Garden who demonstrate, Jake Bruton, um, who demonstrate at, at um, building shows and, um, and do a lot of education. And I have heard over and over and over again that many builders don't understand um, shingle style flashing, even like don't understand, you know, um, how house wraps should be installed and, and reverse laps are problematic. So um, always think like, think like water. Another thing that you need to account for um, with your deck ledger are lateral loads. And you can do this in a couple of ways, um, both serving the same purpose. And, and this, I'm going to show two examples. And this is a joist to joist tension tie that you see here. Um, and so what you're doing is you're using a, these two um, brackets and then a threaded rod to tie the deck joist to the floor joist inside the house. Um, and you need two of these per deck. Um, it doesn't matter the size of your deck. You need two per deck and you need them to be within um, a couple of feet of the end of the deck. And this is really straightforward way to go um, 
when your joists are in line with each other. So when the, the joists inside the house are running in the same direction as the deck joists, it's also a, a good way to go if you have access to those joists inside. It's a new house, um, there's an unfinished basement. It's more challenging when you're adding a deck and you don't have access. It's gonna mean, if you wanna use this approach, it's gonna mean you know cutting holes in the, if it's a finished base, let's say it's a finished basement, it's gonna mean cutting holes in that ceiling to, to create access. Not necessarily that big of a deal. Um, but there is another option, and that is to use a, a bracket like this one from Simpson. Um, and, and this obviously only works if the, um, the deck joists and the ledger fall in the right location, because this, in, with this, you need to be able to um, install that bracket and then drive a structural screw um, right into um, the mud sill or a plate as shown here, we're, we're looking at uh, a double top plate. So um, it needs to be in the things we need to be aligned for this to work, but it's another option that doesn't require you to have that, that access inside. Um, and I just wanted to show this because I said that, that, um, that deck ledgers couldn't be attached to brick or stone veneer, um, but you know, Simpson strong tie has really just um, done a dynamite job for a long time now of coming up with solutions, um, really for builders in general, but particularly for decks. Um, and I think that I sometimes I think that since the hardware that Simpson has come out with has you know really changed deck building codes a lot and um, and really made our decks safer. Um, so this is a hardware that a piece of hardware that they have that does allow you to put um, a ledger on um, on on a brick veneered house. Um, I have no experience with it, but um, it's been out for a little while now. If you have some experience with it, again, love to hear from you in the chat um, about how that's worked for you. Okay. Um, exterior insulation is being installed on more and more houses now. If you live in a a cold climate and where they use the most um, current um, version of the International Residential Code. It, it may be a requirement or close to a requirement. Um, not that there's not other ways around it, but um, it, may, it may be the easiest thing to do to meet our value requirements of the house. So how are we installing ledgers with, um, with exterior insulation? There are a few products that you can use to space your um, you can space your ledger off your house. One of them is a main deck bracket shown here in the main photo. The other one in the smaller photo is from a company called Dextruck. Um, you can find reviews um, and, and um, links to these on finehomemilling.com. Just go on there and search for them. And I wanted to mention earlier when I was talking about deck flashing and talking about that piece of flashing that goes against the house that, you know, I have spoken with builders and deck builders who um, pr just prefer to find a way to space their ledgers off the house a little bit so that, um, so that water has a path so that water, no matter how well you flash your deck, water is not going to get stuck um, between your deck ledger and your house. Um, Peter Yost has told me many times that um, what he calls water held intention um, is, is going to always be a problem on a house. That's basically when water is trapped and has nowhere to go. Um, and he's told me that he's seen some of the best um, water resistant barriers fail when water can't drain. So, um, you know, maybe creating that space isn't, isn't a bad idea at all. Okay, so a, any, any deck that is uh, off the ground higher than uh, 30 inches um, is going to need um, a guard. And um, so we call, we, we talk about them as railings. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna make a distinction about that in just a moment, um, but you need uh, guards or railings on decks that are, um, that are not considered grade level deck. Um, they're going to need to be a minimum of 36 inches tall. Um, they're going to need to have um, openings that don't allow a four inch sphere to pass. This is, you know, the spheres thing is still in uh, the deck building codes. Uh, basically, they, you know, they, they can't be, the, the space has to be less than four inches. Um, and they need to resist a 200 pound concentrated load downward and horizontally. Um, so they need to connect to the framing below and be connected well. 
Um, and that, that um, you know, that horizontal or lateral load on posts is really the one where um, that will make a make the difference between a uh, post that feels sturdy and feels safe and one that doesn't. Um, and so the key here is to really plan your posts um, and find a way to meet that load rating. So here you see a very simple um, drawing, a drawing of a very simple post attachment where you have a post attached outside of um, a rim board and you have a bracket at the top of the post uh, and bolts through the, two bolts through the post um, using that bracket to to prevent the um, or to to meet that lateral load requirement and downward load requirement. Likely a combination of um, of hardware and blocking is required. Here are a bunch of drawings from an article we did at Fine Home Million. Just show all the different scenarios and what you might need to do to meet that um, to meet those load requirements. You can talk to your building official about this. You can just ask them what they like to see. There are some products. I think I mentioned Fasten Master before, and I think Fasten Master has a, it's like a it's like a structural screw that actually has what is what is like a, a nut, this cone-shaped nut on the end. And I believe that those alone through a rim spaced properly can meet the rating. Um, it's a, it's a really fast um, way to do it, a fast but expensive way to do it, a lot more expensive than some um, two-by material and, and bolts. But um, you can ask your billing official what they like to see and if you can possibly do that. Um, but you want, you want the, the thing is that you want sturdy and safe. Um, guards. So um, plan your posts. And then for the for the infill, you've got a lot of a lot of great options. Um, you, you've got the manufactured stuff that you see that nice looking black railing um, in the upper right hand corner stuff that you can buy you slip, you know, most of the time those those you slip over um, a structural post that you've installed. Some of them have um, proprietary mounting hardware that allows you to not need um, a post. Um, you have sort of your your custom um, railing. This one with this um, with this agricultural wire down the bottom. I've always I've always kind of admired this look. I think that's a nice railing. I love the way they incorporated the lighting um, into it. Um, and then you know, cable rail is a really nice option, especially when you want to do something that's sort of semi custom like this. Uh, railing here is um, where the you know the posts in the top uh, the top cap are custom. You've got the curve in it, um, but then you can buy all the components you need for the cable rail. Um, keep in mind that with cable rail, that spacing, that four inch spacing, um, or you know the spacing that will not allow a four inch sphere to pass, is based on when the rail when that cable actually has a little bit of pressure on it. So in other words, you need to not let it open up. And that's why cable rail spacing is usually a little bit tighter. Um, stairs are stairs. So when you're building your deck stairs, you refer to the chapter chapter three in the codes, which are the which is where you will find the chapter on all stairs. So deck stairs are not different than um, stairs inside the house. You need a minimum of 36 inch width. Um, you can have a maximum of um, seven and three quarter inch rise. I know in a lot of places that's taller, a lot of local um, building codes allow an eight inch rise, but the, the current IRC calls for seven and three quarter inch rise. Um, that's the height of your step if you're not familiar with these terms. Um, if you have, uh, if if your um, deck is uh, 30 inches or more above grade, then you have to close your risers, or again, not allow that four inch um, sphere to pass um, underneath your steps. Uh, minimum of 10 inch run, nosing required. All this again, sort of standard um, stair building stuff. If you have four risers, you need at least one handrail between 34 inches and 38 inches. Um, and so that's an interesting thing. And, and I, I, I've, I was confused about this for a while and I've heard people confused about this. So um, I've heard people say you need a rail on, you need guards on your deck if you have four stair risers or more. Um, and 
that's that's really not what the codes say. What the codes say is you need guards on your deck if your deck is over 30 inches above grade. You need handrails on your stairs if you have four risers or more. Uh, making a deck look great with um, a handrail on the stairs that doesn't have guards, I don't know. I'll leave that up to you to figure out how to do it. Um, seems like it would look a little bit awkward to me. Maybe you just, you know, maybe you run that that rail to the house at at the stair or something. Um, I haven't seen that. Um, I've either seen all with or, or sort of all without. Um, and then I would, this is where I wanted to remind you that uh, rails are different than railings. Um, and we call deck railings what, what I mentioned before, commonly referred to railings as what I mentioned before as guards. So um, the posts and the infill that makes up our deck railings are, are called guards. When it comes to stairs, the handrail is a very specific thing and the codes are very specific about it. Um, rails need to be graspable. They need to um, have, a, have a specific height. They need to terminate they need to be continuous and they need to terminate in specific ways. So rails are different than railings and you wanna make sure that you have a uh, proper handrail installed for stairs um, when it's needed. Okay, so there you have it. Um, I hope that, uh, that hope that some of you all stuck with me. Um, it went a little bit longer than I thought it might, um, but there was a lot to cover. There's a lot to designing and building a deck. Um, I hope that the, the chat was um, helpful and that you all um, maybe asked some questions, maybe got some questions answered. And uh, let's welcome Rob back and uh, see if there's, if there's, I think, I think I, I've given all of my deck knowledge, but um, if you have, if there are any questions, let's see if we can answer. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Brian. It was, that was a great presentation. Uh, I mean, I'm sure everyone's going away with some some information, some new things that they've learned. And there were a handful of questions. I, before I get to the questions, I will mention that bolt you mentioned is called the through lock by Fastener. It's 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 like a galvanized screw with a weird little nut on the end of it uh, that you were talking about that would be good for the uh, the guard the guardrail fastening. Yeah, and I tried. Um, we had a couple of those laying around the office, um, and I I tried them on a deck project and. Um, and I thought I thought they were great. Um, you, they're you're going to you're going to see them, and they have this sort of odd spacing requirement. So you're going to see that. Um, I guess you could hide them, um, find a way to hide them. Um, and the, but they they were fast, and they didn't require the blocking and the brackets that um, you know other post connections might require. Yeah, and with the cost of lumber these days, they might not actually be that much more expensive. That's, that's right. <laughs> Uh, before I get to the regular questions, uh, we did have people ask about the recording of this and the PowerPoint presentation. And the recording will be on the website at findhomebuilding.com slash webinars in a couple of days. And Brian, I imagine you can make your slides available where we could upload them there as well. Absolutely. I will send, uh, I'll send my, uh, my presentation over to the team. And if they want to put it on the website, I'm happy to have it there. Okay, great. So I'll get to one question that I think is probably one of the more complicated ones to answer um, is uh, when you talk about all the flashing details, when you're doing a ledger, uh, if you're doing a retrofit, you know, decking on an existing house, uh, obviously you need to peel back at least a course or two of siding. Can you, can you talk about anything about sort of the process, which someone should expect to do in that situation? Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's a great question. And, and, you know, unfortunately, the answer to, to retrofit and remodel questions is so often it depends because it, it, it depends what you're going to see when you're when you get there. Um, but yeah, you're going to have to um, the, de the deck, uh, oddly enough, the deck rehab that I mentioned before, uh, the deck ledger was nailed over the siding. So don't do that. Like Rob said, peel back um, either if there's a skirt board, you'll have to you'll have to cut it off. Um, that would just be coming off anyway. Peel peel up a couple layers of shingles. Hopefully what you find there is um, a, a water resistive barrier that's in decent condition. Um, and then if you can get to that point, you can do everything that I showed and you can just sort of take that water resistive barrier and kind of um, 
kind of lift it up onto the house, tape it up for a while. And then when you get your flashing details done, you can, um, you can lay it back down. I have seen people go to the length when there's, when there's no water resistor barrier or doesn't look good. I have people seen people go to the length of peeling up more siding to at least, um, at least get one in to keep, uh, to get you know water flowing over that ledger. But I'd say at that point, if there's no water resistive barrier there, just do what you can to keep water from getting between, you know, in that joint between um, the ledger and the house, because that's where water's gonna, if water gets there, it's gonna sit there and that's where you're gonna end up with rot. And maybe water finding its way into your house, which is, um, you know, which you don't want either. For sure. Uh, we had a couple of people asking questions on uh, on wood sealers. Any, you know, a couple of people were asking, you know, recommendations for a cedar decking sealer. Whether or not anyone has had any success uh, keeping that nice reddish color on on ipe or other hardwoods. Do you have any experience with that at all, Brian? I don't have any experience with specific products that I can that I can recommend. Um, I think people do have. I think people do have uh, success keeping those decks looking good, but it's a lot of maintenance. If you go that route, um, that's a that's a maintenance that you're choosing to do maintenance. You're choosing to refinish that deck regularly, and if the deck is exposed, I mean the sun is such a killer, right? Of of finishes and horizontal surfaces take the brunt of it. So you should i mean if you like that look if that's the look you want find the, find a finish that that gives you the look you like but plan on um plan on you know resurfacing it pretty regularly and and you know really you know given given the my my limited experience with refinishing decks um if you let it go too long it becomes a lot of work to do it right again so if you go that route just just Find the product that you like that looks good, and then you know plan on before you have um, before it's failing, keep recoating it. That that pressure treated deck that I mentioned, that I realized is it loves the finish. You know, it it thrives. It 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 kind of like it comes back to life almost when you put a when you put a good finish on it. Um, and so, and I think it's true with with any natural wood deck. So you know, keep the if you want it to look good for a long time, keep the finish fresh. Yeah, and one, one recommendation we've mentioned a few times when finishing is brought, uh, brought up in these types of conversations is go to uh, your, the, your local high quality building supply you know, place, like you know, and not necessarily your, you know, your big box store or hardware store, basically wherever the, the contractors in your area are shopping and the people at that there are gonna probably have good recommendations for, for products that work well. Yeah, and we do have an article um, at at Fine Home Building on uh, on choosing deck finishes. It's a few years old now, but I, get, I I'm sure it's still very relevant. And you know, we weren't, of course, we weren't able to like um, test them. We don't we're, we don't have that kind of setup to test um, the durability of finishes. But um, it'll give you an idea of um, how things work and what to use, what to use, where and what to expect. Yeah. Um. Another question, and we actually had a comment about this, uh, you know, thoughts on helical peers experience with them. Uh, and uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt, one of the participants today said he used helicals down five feet with a load bearing capacity of 25,000 pounds. And he likes the fact that it doesn't make a mess and you're ready to build as soon as those things are in the ground. You don't have to work backfill, you don't have to you know, you don't have to wait for concrete to set or wonder if you get your, your footings the right size. Uh, have you seen any of them go on in on job sites for decks? Um, yes. And, um, and, and, you know, I haven't, I haven't, ha I haven't used them myself, um, but I have, I have spoken with um, and seen them used on a number of projects for a number and for a number of different projects. And at this point, I mean, you know, whenever something, you know, not that they're really that new, right? Because they've been used for a long time, but they're getting, they're just sort of getting a foothold in residential construction. So of course, you know, anyone can argue that, you know, that something like that isn't tested yet in this particular use, but, um, but I think they're a great solution. I mean, look at, we did a, we published an article recently in Fine Home Building about a, a footing retrofit for a whole house where they used helical piers as a solution. Um, and, you know, in this case, it, they, 
they were, you know, they were done, they were done in a day shoring up a house. So to have someone come in and be able to, yeah, not have to, not have to dig, um, digging, digging piers to frost depth is, is tough work, especially if you have a, if you have a big deck and you have a lot of them to do, um, it makes them, it, it does make a mess. It tears up the ground if you bring other types of equipment in. So, um, I say give helical piers a shot For sure. and you know, they can, they can, uh, the, the, the installers can mount they can weld whatever kind of bracket you want right to the top of the pier so like you could um you know if you had like a grade level deck for example you wanted to just set your you know you want to just set your beam right in there they can do a custom bracket welded right onto the top of it if you if you need a post base they can do a custom post base welded right onto the top of it so like you said rob you're you can be working on getting your ledger installed while they're putting the the piers in the ground and you finish your ledger, they finish the piers, and you're you're off and running. Definitely. Um, you had showed uh, those deck blocks. I, I assume they're talking about the stacked stacked uh, pier systems. Uh, and someone was asking about those for allowable allowability in seismic areas. I mean, I, that's kind of a specific question that probably have to ask your local uh, building inspector, I'd imagine. Yeah, so I, so I know very little about seismic areas, so I won't even, I don't even want to comment on that. I would just say, you know, ask, um, yeah, yeah, and get, get that right. <laughs> yep. Um, how about any recommendations for planning or design software that are uh, accessible to homeowners? Well, the first, you know, the, I, I am, uh, I am not uh, much of a techie. In fact, um, you know, I have, I'm sitting behind me right here, stack stacks and stacks of graph paper that I have used to design my, the, you know, the house that I'm building this yep. spring. Um, so I don't have a ton of experience, um, but I've seen, I've been really super impressed with um, what I've seen people learn to do with SketchUp, especially non-pros who don't want to learn something like, um, you know, something like obviously AutoCAD or Chief Architect or, you know, Soft Plan or one of these. Um, there's so many really excellent um, tools for design, for designing houses and decks and chief architect, one of those companies may actually have a version that is specific to decks um, of their, of their software. So you, so look at those, look at the, the major companies and, and I'm sure that someone has it. I remember seeing it not too long ago. Um, so it's out there, but that's, that learning curve is probably a bit steeper. Um, they're very technical and they're for professionals. So it's probably a bit steeper than learning to use SketchUp. Right. Uh, we had a question about attaching stairs to the rim joist. Uh, anything you could talk, comment about the, that detail in general? Yeah, I didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to get into stair attachments because they're sort of they're, 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 There's another thing like your posts that you really need to um, that you really need to plan. Um, and so you, you can attach um, you can attach your your stringers to your rim joist with um, with hangers, with stringer hangers. Simpson has stringer hangers, and you know they're really easy to use, and you get a nice secure connection. Um, if your rim joist doesn't have the room for that first step down, then you'll need to come up with something else, um, and you know you'll need to come up with another way to do that. And I've seen people put posts underneath there, and then run sort of a separate ledger across those posts to attach their um, stairs to. There's a really old school way where you notch your stringer and it actually comes up behind the rim joist and you attach it behind the rim joist. I'm not sure if that's allowable by code anymore, but people used to do that. Um, people used to do that quite a bit. Um, I didn't mention um, I didn't mention footings for deck stairs either, but there are um, there, you will probably run the run depending on your building official, you may need anything from a frost depth footing for where your deck stairs land uh, to to nothing to you know the first stone yeah. your stone patio um, and I so I would walk I would go in and talk to your um, for when it comes to the landing in particular I'd go in and talk to your building official about it yeah and, th and that I, that might even depend on whether you're building it next to an existing patio or not because I think fine home building just did an article on on uh, laying a deck next to an existing patio, right? Yeah, and they landed it. They landed it right on the 
on the patio. So it was obviously fine there. Um, and we've also done an article with Mike Gurton on, on deck stairs where he suggests, I believe he suggests a frost depth footing in that article. Uh, Ryan made a comment about software that Simpson actually has a deck building uh, software on their website that actually also helps you select uh, hardware, which is makes sense since they sell the hardware. Yes. For it. Um, well, as much as you know, as much as a a, a monopoly that they have on this on this, you know, I, at Simpson's a good company. If they have deck design software, I would go check it out. Um, you know, they offer they offer um, they all just offer tons of great solutions. In fact, one of the things that they came out with um, a few years ago that I really think is cool is they have some some hardware options for like post spaces and whatnot that are decorative. So if you're gonna, you know, if you're not going to, if you're gonna have like, you know, if you want to, if you want to dress up your deck, but you don't want to like, you know, do something like wrap your posts, you know, you they have hardware that actually, I think they might even have it for. Um, uh, for post connections for your for your guardrails, just really nice looking hardware that will help you meet the load requirements of the building codes. Yeah. Uh, how about any thoughts on building boxed stairs versus stringers uh, for when you're building a low deck? Yeah, I think it's great. I I actually um, I did that and um, and I thought it was um, I thought and and I've also seen and I, and I stole the idea from a, an FHB. Uh, deck that we built. Um, I think it's a great way to go. Um, those they're sturdy. They're they're um, it just feels they feel really easy to build. They feel really sturdy once they're once they're installed. Yeah, and that's just um, I mean the the what what he called them. It kind of it says exactly what they are. You like you build a big um, deep tread, and then you know let's say you have you need two two steps. You let's say you have three risers. You know then you build. Um, you need to build one just enough smaller than that, that it can sit on it and gives you the right uh, tread depth, uh, you know, back and you fasten those two together, you push them up towards the deck, you find a way to attach them to the, to the rim. Yeah. And, and if you're going to do some kind of skirting on the side, it actually gives you a little bit of room for, for adjustments too, because you could probably slide the boxes around, you know, to yeah, absolutely. And, and a great way to do like, um, to take the complication out of doing, um, like let's say you wanted stairs that wrapped a corner, you know, uh, take the complication out of doing that. So, I mean, getting, you know, wrapping a corner with stringers becomes more challenging and you do it with those boxes and it's just a lot less challenging. You're just, you're really just making boxes with, you know, blocking in them. Definitely. Okay, another question. Any thoughts on whether a deck needs to be sloped or not? Oh, well, um, definitely it definitely needs to be level um you mean you definitely don't want it, you will drain water back potentially you could potentially drain water back towards your house if it's not um hopefully you know your if your deck boards are running um parallel to the house it, you know hopefully water will drain between them um but yeah i, I mean it, uh, the, the slightest slope imperceptible slope i mean it, it couldn't hurt yeah, I mean, even even just for just for uh, avoiding pooling, if you've got natural wood decking too, because if there's any right. cupping in the decking, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Another question: Someone has an elevated deck. How do you do the layouts? The footings line up where you need to align with the deck above. So, you know, I guess they're worried about. Uh, you know, you're sort of working in, out in space. I mean, I've seen people actually. Well. I've seen people actually frame out sort of like a loose frame of where the deck's going to be and just plumb down from there. Um, so is the question how to locate footings? Yeah, I guess really that's what they're getting at. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you, I, the, you locate footings uh, very carefully. Um, that's the first, yeah. that's the first, um, you know, the first answer. Um, but, you know, so you can do, you can do a number of things. I mean, you can, you can, you can, um, oh, geez, we, we have a, we have a whole six page article, I believe on locating footings. I, what I want to say is it's not as challenging as it sounds. I've located, I've poured a bunch of footings in my life and they've all been where they needed to be. Um, you measure out from the house, 
make sure that you're measuring square. So that's one important thing. Like when you pull a tape from the house, you need to make sure that you're pulling the tape out from the house square. So you need to do a three, four, five um, triangle to make sure you're pulling out square. If you do that in a couple of places and create a control line um, that, that you know now you've been pulling square, you know that that control line is par running parallel to the house, you know, then you can, then you can measure find the location of your outside footings and you can measure in from there. I mean, this is technical thing to just be describing like this um, without, without sort of some drawings that show how to do it. Um, most importantly, make sure that you're measuring square from the house when you measure. Yeah. And I know that both uh, video, some of the video series on decking uh, deck projects and some of the articles in the deck project guide will have, uh, you know, detail, detailed explanations of, of yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, and one of the things is um, is to, uh, another thing that I'll mention about that is, it, and this is what I've always done, you know, a measure for the, for the hole, you know, dig the hole, dig the hole a little extra big, and then measure again when you've got your builder's tube in the hole and make sure that it's in the right place. I actually, on one project, I, I don't know why, I, I mean, I guess I was a little nervous on this project, but I actually made a little cap for the, for the so, and, 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 you know, found the center of um, the builder's tube um, it, with, it had a mark there. And I put every tube, I put the cap on it and I, and I measured and made sure that I was hitting that center um, of the tube. So, um, you know, if, I mean, it, truth is if the center is, is, an, is an inch or two off in, in one direction, you're fine. Um, sure. with this, but, um, and you can do the same thing when you're dropping your anchor bolts in, if you want to, you can, you can pull lines again, drop your anchor bolts in and make sure you get them in the right place. Like you can double check and triple check, um, that work. For sure. All right. Well, we've, we've actually gotten quite a, uh, quite a bit longer than we expected. I'll just ask one more question and this is kind of deter determined by the fasteners. Uh, so, so this is really only if you're doing face fastening, but, uh, recommendations for gaps or spacing between deck boards. Um, it's going to depend on the deck board. Um, and I'm not sure about like, so for example, um, when you install pressure treated deck boards, um, you can, you can press them tight against each other because pressure treated lumber is typically very wet and it, and they're going to shrink and you're going to have plenty gap when plenty of a gap when those boards shrink, which is not going to take that, excuse me, that long at all. Um, other species, you might want to get a, a recommendation for that species. I'm not sure how they all behave. Um, you definitely, you know, it's nice to have water drain. So I think a little bit of a gap is good, but you don't want to gap them from the, Get go such that if then they shrink, you have really big gaps. For sure. Yeah. But, um, all right. I think that's going to be it. I just want to um, thank you, Brian, for the great presentation and thank everyone for joining us. And again, thank Feeney for sponsoring the presentation. Uh, just just a note on, on Feeney, you, you had mentioned uh, how much you, you cared about uh, saving the view and keeping keeping things unobstructed. So Feeney's, Feeney's website is a good place to check out options for that because they have everything from uh, cable railing to glass panels to mesh panels. Uh, so uh, go check that out again. That's feeneyinc.com. And uh, a few people- Yeah, asked... I, uh, Rob, I want to second that because I mentioned Simpson and their solutions a lot tonight. And I love companies that are solution oriented and Feeney's one of them too. Yeah, uh, I mean, the- you were talking about uh, deck uh, guard posts too, because I know that they have, uh, you know, on their aluminum post systems, they're fasteners that are built, designed right into the posts to provide yeah. that, that load path uh, requirements. Yeah, for and, sure. Uh, and I've even seen, so there's some neat new things on there, like these resin panels that have like cool patterns embedded in them. And so there's, there's so many options nowadays yeah. with, with that kind of stuff, so. Cool. But uh, all right, and uh, again, uh, check out findhomelink.com slash webinars for both the recording of this presentation and for future webinars. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us and have a good night.